Here I want to attempt to simplify some of the complexities associated with gel electrophoresis and explain them to you. This is the basic equipment and setup, and this is a typical end result that you'll see. But how do we go from here to here? Well, stay tuned. Well, here we have DNA fragments migrate through a gel. So we are going through a gel, and this gel is going to allow portions or pieces of DNA to be able to move through it. Now, the gel electrophoresis is a procedure that separates out these molecules based on their rate of movement through the gel and is influenced by an electrical field. Keep in mind that DNA does have a negative charge to its backbone, allowing this positive negative charge to be able to move the fragments. Gel electrophoresis is a widely used technique uh, for a, uh, analysis of nucleic acids as well as proteins. I'm give you just a general breakdown that these BP stands for base pairs. So a thousand base pairs versus only a hundred. The smaller the base pairs, the smaller the molecular size, the greater the distance that they, it can move or travel. And that's going to be a consistency with the gel electrophoresis process. So this gel electrophoresis, well, it requires an agarose gel. Well, agarose gel uh, with electrophoresis is routinely used in preparation for DNA analysis. If you look at it under a scanning electron microscope, it kind of looks like this. Think of it as like a net or a bunch of little pores uh, through here. It's a polymerase agarose, it's porous, allowing for the movement of DNA. This is why the larger fragments kind of get caught up in this net, and the smaller fragments are able to move through it much easier. Uh, it's a linear pimel extracted from seaweed specifically, and while you may think it's got a seaweed color, it actually ends up being this white, um, kind of thin, uh, small and fine powder. DNA is negatively charged, as I mentioned, so when placed in an electrical field, DNA will migrate towards the positive pole, um, or the called the anode. And an agarose gel is used to slow the movement of DNA, and it's separated by its size, with the smaller fragments moving further than the larger one. So here we're looking at how fast will the DNA migrate. Well, it depends on the size of the DNA. Small DNA will move faster than large DNA, and electrophoresis separates DNA according to size. So here are the wells. This is where we initially place the DNA, and we fill those up with our DNA, which contains small and large fragments. We turn the power on, keeping in mind the positive uh, on the far end of the gel and the negative over here. DNA with its negative charge will get pulled towards the positive end, and depending on its size, will separate. Here we see an example of the small bits of DNA, smaller sections, smaller base pairs of DNA traveling further than the larger base pairs. Within agarose gel, linear DNA migrates inversely proportional to the log base 10 of their molecular weight. What does that simply mean? Smaller fragments move further than larger ones. So if you want to make an agarose gel, as I said, the agarose is this white powder. It's prepared by combining agarose powder and a buffer solution. And then it's going to have to be heated up to the point of boiling, so you also need a flask for boiling. The electrophoresis equipment specifically is going to require a casting tray. So you want to seal the edges of the casting tray, put in the combs, we see here, and that's going to be placed in, on a level surface, and none of the combs should be touching the surface of the casting tray. What these combs are going to do is create little wells that you're going to be able to put the DNA in. Now to give you just an idea, these are very small, so what makes this such an efficient operation is it can occur on a tabletop. It doesn't need a large area um, to occur. It's a power supply, it's a gel tank, a casting tray, um, some power, and some combs here. Now when you mix the agarose uh, with the buffer, we then need to boil it. So when we're looking at our agarose and our buffer solution, we want to combine the agarose powder and buffer solution, use the flask uh, that is several times larger than the volume of the buffer because we'll be heating it. Agarose is insoluble at room temperature, so when you first add it, you're going to get this kind of like immediate separation. Then the agarose solution is boiled until it's clear. You want to gently swirl the solution periodically when heating to allow all the grains of agarose to dissolve well in it. Be careful when boiling. The agarose solution may become superheated and may boil violently if been heated for too long, uh, for example, in a microwave oven. Uh, so you want to be very careful with that boiling process. Keep it controlled. Then once boiled, um, you want to get some uh, mitts that actually have some insulation to them because you're going to be pouring this very hot liquid. You want the uh, agarose solution to cool slightly, but not too much, otherwise it will solidify in the flask. When I say cool, it's about 60 degrees Celsius, and then carefully pour the melted agarose solution into the casting tray to avoid air bubbles. Each of the gel combs should be submerged in the melted agarose solution, as we see here. When cooled, the ag agarose polymerizes, forming a flexible gel. It should appear lighter in color when completely cooled, and this will take about half an hour to 45 minutes to occur. Then you want to carefully remove the tape on the sides and the combs and you have a prepared gel. 
then you're gonna place the gel in the electrophoresis chamber. Now the advantage of this, you can make the gel the day before, a couple days before, and hold on to it before you're able to run it. So this is one advantage that maybe you go through a day of gel making, and you go through a day of kind of running through the analysis portion. You want to add this to the um, chamber, and then you want to add enough buffer to cover the gel to a depth of at least one millimeter. Make sure the well is filled with the buffer solution. And keep in mind that DNA is going to migrate this way because here's our positive anode, and here's our negative cathode, and you can see our buffer solution and series of wells. Uh, the sample preparation and gel loading. You want a six-time loading buffer. Uh, this is going to have this really dark kind of blue color. Um, you can use glycerol for weight. Um, you can use uh, bromophile blue for color, and you can mix those two. You want to mix the samples of DNA with the six eggs sample loading buffer uh, with tracking dye. This allows the samples to be seen when loading into the gel, makes it a lot easier. Uh, it increases the density of the samples, causing them to sink into the gel wells. The last thing you want to do is go through and load those gel wells and have everything kind of float and go into the buffer solution. You want it to stay in that well region because so you want it to push it or pull it through that gel um, to allow that separation to occur. Then, with the good pipetting skills, you want to carefully place the pipette to over the well, gently expel the sample. The sample should sink into the well. Be careful not to puncture the gel with the pipette tip. This requires a very steady hand. Then we're actually running the gel. You want to place the cover over the electrophoresis chamber, collect the electrical leads, connect the electrical leads to the power supply. Be sure the leads are attached correctly with the positive and negatives being in the right area because DNA will migrate towards the red or the anode, uh, and the positive in this case. When the, powder, when the power is turned on, bubbles should form in the electrodes, in the electrophoresis chamber, indicating that you do have a flow of electrical current. And just be mindful that that is um, electrical hazard, so you want to be mindful when that power is on. Running the gel when it's in progress, after the current is applied, make sure the gel is running in the correct direction. Double, triple check this, otherwise you might lose your entire experiment. Uh, Bromethyl blue will run in the same direction as the DNA, and it gives you an idea of here's the wells. And you can see that it is moving towards the anode, it is moving through the gel there, so this is hooked up correctly. DNA ladder is also recommended to be added, an inclusion of a DNA ladder, which is basically just sections of known sizes. It's called a ladder because it kind of looks like this nice little rungs of a ladder. It makes it easy to determine the sizes of unknown DNA fragments. So this is a known defined inclusion of different base pairs. It allows you to compare that to your own sample. Note, Blumenthal blue migrates to approximately the rate at about 300 base pairs of DNA molecule. So if you see a little darker band in that area, it could simply be the Blumenthal blue. When you're staining the gel, then place the gel in a staining tray containing warm dilute stain. Allow the gel to stain for about 20 to 30 minutes. Follow the protocol suggested. To remove excess stain, allow the gel to destain in water for a little bit. Replace the water several times for an efficient destain. So you're getting a well-defined band region. You have many options when you're looking at gel staining. Uh, Athidium bromide is one that's probably used quite extensively uh, because it does bind very efficiently to the DNA and it fluoresces under UV light. However, be mindful and a caution is that gloves should be worn at all times when handling this uh, because it is a powerful mutagen. It will bind to the DNA in the gel and also the DNA in your hands and your own body. Uh, so it can be toxic, uh, it can potentially be a carcinogen. So again, be mindful when handling bromethyl blue, always, always wear gloves. As a result, there's some safer alternatives like Methyl Blue or BioRad makes one, Awards makes some. Uh, the advantage is that these, these are inexpensive, they're a lot less toxic, they don't require a UV light source, no hazardous waste disposal. But they're not used in some cases because they can be less sensitive, more DNA is needed on the gel, and longer staining and destaining times. Uh, so again, the safer alternatives do have some advantages, but Athidium Bromide, when used on those kind of trace samples, just be mindful as a handler of that material. Here's a gel with Athenium bromide stain. Uh, we see it here placed on a UV light transluminar. Athenium bromide requires ultraviolet light to be visualized. So right now with the UV light off, you really can't see anything, but this would be the surface it would be prepared on. Then when you turn the UV light on, you can see here you should be wearing protective glasses if you are viewing it. You can start to see some banding developed here, and you can take a good image and then be able to use that for comparisons. Visualizing DNA with that thenium bromide this is what a kind of picture would look like. Here are the wells, here are the ladders, and here's the PCR product, it's Plumas Chain product. Samples 1, 4, 6, and 7 were positive for 500 base pair DNA fragments, and we could see that list right here. 
So again, it gives you just kind of that um, idea of being able to separate DNA, determine if a certain fragment or base pair length is present. Here's the visualizing the DNA with the quick view stain. Here we see the same wells, we see the latter, we see the same uh, PCR product. We see here one, six, seven, 10, and 12 are positive for 500 base pair fragments. This is not a thinning and bromide. In this case, there was sufficient amounts of DNA. The sensitivity wasn't necessarily required. Um, so we could use one of those safer alternative staining products. And here you can see compared to the gold standard of a thinning and bromide, you could see a very similar result.